the founder of EcoStyles, Nina Gibor is a leading sustainable fashion educator, international speaker, sustainability consultant, clothes swap expert, and eco-stylist. Through EcoStyles, she actively engages with communities to promote a holistic approach to sustainable fashion. Nina also serves as the director of the Circular Economy and Waste Program at the Australia Institute. With a master's degree in international development, she guest lectures at universities both in Australia and internationally. Additionally, Nina is the founder of Clothes Swap and Style, organizing clothes swaps for over 12 years. The fashion treadmill is a phrase that I coined about eight or nine years ago to talk about the core issues that are fueling waste and overconsumption and overproduction in the fashion industry and textiles industry. Um, and ultimately, these are the issues that lead to, you know, the, the climate issues and the circularity issues and waste issues that we have in the fashion industry. So I thought fundamentally, this is a, a pretty um, important principle to understand and embrace. So a little bit about me in addition to the very kind introduction by Morris is, is you know, like he said, I'm a sustainable fashion educator. I work in the circular economy and waste space. I'm an international speaker, close swap maven and eco stylist. And what I love about the different things I do that is that I get to work with different levels of society um, from individuals through to high school kids, through to um, municipalities, media um, and work on policies um, here in Australia, research policies that will help shift the status quo. Um, and that enables me to, you know, gauge the levels and issues that are needed or um, gaps uh, whether gaps in knowledge or um, infrastructure that we need to address to fix the problems. Um, how I got started in this space, I'll tell you very briefly, and, and hopefully this will make a little bit of sense as we move on through the presentation, is that when I was a child, my mother and siblings used to watch movies from the 40s and 50s. Um, and, you know, I, I would see, you know, style icons like Audrey Hepburn and Grace Kelly and Sophia Loren and some of these, you know, historic style icons. And I love this style. I completely embraced the style. So you can see in the photo here, because Audrey Hepburn is, you know, for me, a, a huge in, inspiration in several ways. Um, this is me sort of doing my Audrey Hepburn style. Now, what that pushed me into was a love for vintage fashion. So when I was, I grew up in the U.S. When I was a teenager, my family, we went to Nigeria, which is in West Africa. And I remember seeing clothes being imported, secondhand clothes that were being imported. Um, and it was a mix of modern clothing, trendy clothes, and vintage clothing. Now, this was at a time when vintage fashion wasn't yet trendy in the West so much. So people were literally throwing out their grandparents' old clothes right it wasn't cool back then so but for me this was such a treat because this was the stuff that i was seeing in the movies that i loved um and the icons that i adored so for me it was like christmas being able to have all these clothes however i also noticed at the same time that a lot of those clothes that were being imported were causing local fashion and clothing businesses and textile businesses to close down because they couldn't compete with how cheap the clothes were you know, the fast fashion of it all. They couldn't compete with, you know, secondhand fast fashion. And also a lot of the clothes were ending up, um, you know, I was seeing them end up as mountains of trash mixed with household trash. And it smelled so bad. It reeked terribly. And things would happen like, you know, whenever it would rain, it would rain through these mountains of trash and into local lakes and rivers that people would use for household purposes, domestic purposes. And I remember thinking, this is toxic. This must be really toxic. This can't be healthy, right? But at that time, nobody seemed concerned enough to actually do something about it. Um, so fast forward, I think because of these issues that I noticed, in addition to the fact that I loved the clothing so much, I think that kind of became my purpose and mission was to work in this space and do something about it, even though I didn't realize at the time that it was going to be a lifelong career. So moving on, um, so fashion trends. Now the fashion trend mill comes from the notion of fashion trends. Now we all know what fashion trends are, I believe we do. Um, most of our lives, we've been hearing about fashion trends. You know, you're watching a TV show or you're watching the news or you're reading a magazine. Um, you see, or on TikTok even, you see somebody come up and be, a stylist will come and say, this season's trends are, 
and they tell you what this season you are supposed to be wearing because if you're not wearing those trends you're not okay i'm being sarcastic I'm, I'm sure you can tell but you know it was that thing that we grew up our whole lives with some aspects of the fashion industry making us feel like we're not okay unless we're following the latest fashion trends now this is a very capitalist concept um that you know was used to make people buy stuff that they don't need um to impress people that you don't know or even like right so um you know hence you know terminologies like the fashion police and things like that um and this is something a concept that led to um people feeling like i said not enough um a bit of mental health crises for some people and definitely a drain on finances for a lot of people now fashion trends weren't all this wasn't as bad um originally you know fashion trends have been around probably since the you know over a century maybe even um i remember seeing i've seen adverts on youtube for um hats and things like that from the 40s but the thing is when we when fashion was only based on four seasons it the waist levels weren't that bad they were bad but you know getting towards the 80s and 90s but it wasn't that bad because you know you had just four seasons so you'd have a brand would probably produce one collection for that season right so if it's winter of course you have your your winter collection you buy the stuff for winter you use it for a whole season which is roughly about 3 months before the weather changes you know to spring and you buy clothes that are appropriate for spring that's pretty good and also previously a lot of clothes were made from natural textiles like cotton um uh you know silk uh wool you know cashmere th mohair things like that natural textiles that were potentially compostable and had less environmental impact um less damage did less damage to the planet um and then something interesting happened so before I talk about <laughs> the boom in fashion, I'll talk about, explain what the fashion trend mill is. So the fashion trend mill is the modern cultural trend and lifestyle that we have now, which is based on overconsumption, which is fueled by the linear take, make, and waste system. So as I mentioned earlier, when we had four seasons, we were consuming more accordingly, but the fashion trend mill, something happened somewhere along the line where now just over consuming stuff for the sake of consuming is what we do now so we had we used to have four seasons but now a brand will you know particularly fast fashion brands will produce you know probably three two to three collections a week right so it's not based on season it's just based on producing for the sake of trends and selling right um so we don't think about it now but a lot of the things that we buy we have less attachment to because we know that it's affordable from in most cases and we can dispose of it right uh which is something that has has led to a lot of waste and this is our lifestyle this is our modern cultural lifestyle in a lot of western countries now the take make waste system is about extracting natural resources from the planet to make products that we use you know for relatively short periods of time and then waste it dispose of it and often it goes to landfill so that's the linear take make waste system so when you look at fast fashion and overconsumption so fast fashion came in around sort of the 90s the late 80s 90s um and early 2000s and fast fashion as we know it now um came about through brands like Zara and H&M so Zara and H&M were the ones who kind of took the fashion trend concept and kind of went with it, you know, quadrupled and tripled it to the point where they started overproducing and people started overconsuming as well. So they would, you know, copy designer styles, they would use cheaper materials, um and sometimes they would make clothes not to last because it's kind of meant to be disposable. because ideally you don't need to keep it for so long right you you wear it as a trend when that trend is over in a week or two you dispose it and buy something else that was the 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 linear cycle that's been happening so how one of the ways they did this is you know of course they 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 would you know sort of sometimes artificially artificially manufacture trends 
or hop onto existing trends of the industry. They use influencers, use celebrities to um, promote and advertise. And then, you know, they would have planned obsolescence. So as I mentioned, planned obsolescence is, is essentially manufacturing something to have deliberately have a short shelf life. So if you use, for example, cheap zippers, you know, the zipper breaks after a short period of, of time of using that product or the buttons pop off or the material is just so poor that once it's washed or used a few times, it just doesn't have that same luster that it had. Um, colors, you know, when you wash something, the colors fade, right? So those are plant obsolescence tactics that make you dispose of something quickly and go and buy a new one because often it's cheaper to buy something new again then repair it, right? So they use all these tactics to skyrocket their profits. And um, let's say H and M and Zara. There was a time they were worth four, five, four or five billion dollars. Um, this was, you know, in uh, sort of mid, sort of, sort of around 2015, 2016, 2017. That time they were around four or five billion dollars, and. Um, so we had this other brand that was in the wings called Shein, this brand called Shein, which I'm sure you've heard of, was in the wings watching what was happening, seeing how Zara and H&M and other brands had created this model where they were just making so much money in such a short amount of time and all the you know business model of planned obsolescence and all these other things. And they were like, you know what? Hold my purse. Or in Australia, as we say, hold my beer. <laughs> and they came out. Uh, with their stuff and they took the fast fashion model and went on steroids okay but by that i mean they were producing far more than h&m or zara and much quicker than h&m and zara right and the other brand team also has done this and i'll talk about this a little bit more um, in the next few slides so this is this is the fashion trend mill basically on steroids right that take make waste system uh, let's look at some of the stats with what I'm talking about, just to give you more context. So this is kind of comparing fast fashion versus ultra fast fashion. Now, I refer to fast fashion brands, the pioneering brands, H&M and Zara, as the founding fathers of fast fashion. And um, ultra fast fashion brands like Shein and Temu are like next generation. <laughs> okay, so... This is a, a little case study between H&M and Shein. So H&M in 2022 was valued at $12 billion, right? And in the same year, Shein, who started after H&M, you know, in less than a decade, was valued at $100 billion. So, you know, when I said, you know, fast fashion on steroids, it's really on steroids. That's, that's like, geez, like eight times more than what Shein, sorry, more than what H&M is worth, right, about that. And then you have, in a four-month period of January to April in 2022, H&M had 4,414 new styles on their website. And in the same amount of time, Shein had 315,000 new styles on their website just to give you context of this whole thing. Um, so what that means is, is, is that, like I said, it, there are no words, <laughs> right? There are no words. You can imagine the environmental destruction that's happening um, through that process. So it's not just Shein and Tamu. There's other brands like AliExpress, uh, uh, um, Amazon as well. So um, basically, these four uh, fa fast fashion, ultra fast fashion platforms that I mentioned, uh, Shein, Ali, AliExpress, Timu, Amazon, they collectively, they ship about 10,000 tons of product per day in one day, right? And that's the equivalent of 108 uh, Boeing freighters, right? Moving across the planet every single day just to ship products. Right. And products that will probably be used, probably not even at all, or for very short periods of time. Um, and Shein currently puts out about 10,000 new styles on their platform every single day. So Shein has been operating for more than a decade, whereas Timu began in 2022. 
Now remember this as I read off the next couple of statistics. Sheehan's sales revenue in 2022 was $32.5 billion. Now Timu had $18 billion in sales in 2023. Now why this is insane, if you think about it, is that Sheehan at least had about a decade, more than a decade, to build up to this level of wealth. Timu started in July 2022, and already in the space of about a year or a year and a half, was making $18 billion in sales. That's insane. So it's like Sheehan was ultra fast fashion. Timu is almost like a step further. They've done better than Sheehan. And what's really scary is that think about, so who's next on the horizon? So the next step level is not just going to be, you know, ultra fast fashion. It'll be supersonic fast fashion. It'll be fast fashion at the speed of sound, right? Almost, right? Because this is ridiculous. Now, the reason why these brands are able to make so much profit in in such relatively short periods of time is because of issues like modern slavery and human rights abuses. So this is the ethics and social, social injustice side of the fashion industry. Now, this is literally the business model. Use slave labor so that you manufacture and you keep all the profits. Right now, I talked about uh, Shein being valued at one hundred billion dollars in twenty twenty two. Currently, they're they're now valued as of twenty twenty three. Sorry, I forgot to mention they're now valued at about sixty four billion dollars, sixty three, sixty four billion dollars. However, when they were valued at one hundred billion dollars, it was a huge thing in the media. All the financial papers, like you know, finance, you know, you read business news, um, you know, platforms for entrepreneurs. And financiers, and they would they would talk about they were lauding Shein's success, right? And they weren't telling the truth, saying that the business model is actually modern slavery and environmental destruction. They were just looking at the profit side of it, and that's because we have such a capitalist world that everything is about bottom line profits. Capitalism, extreme capitalism, doesn't really take into um, consideration the human side of things, the environmental cost of what we manufacture. And this is what we have to shift in analyzing um, whether success levels or business or or production. We have to factor in in, the environmental costs, biodiversity loss, the toxic chemicals and water, things I'll I'll cover um, in the next couple of slides. And so the thing with the human rights abuses is that there's, according to ethical, ethical fashion report by uh, World Baptist Aid, there's roughly around 60 million garment workers in the world. And when they surveyed brands, um, they found out that uh, only about 10% of fashion businesses or textile businesses could say that they were proved that they were paying livable wages to their workers. So just imagine only about 10% of 60 million garment workers in the world have been proven to be given livable wages. Livable wages means they can afford to have, you know, sufficient food, um, housing, you know, the basic amenities, health, health care and all these things, looking after your loved ones and so on. Now, let's talk about fashion's environmental impact. Most people don't know that a lot of our clothes are made from plastic, about 62% of the clothes that are made in the world are made from synthetics, right? Majority plastic. Now, plastic comes from petrochemicals, fossil fuels. And the thing about plastics is that, you know, when you use plastics, whether it's during the manufacturing process, whether it's when it's on our bodies, whether it's um, where we're just, you know, selling it, buying it into stores, interacting with it, um, or when we wash it, or when it goes to landfill, it releases microplastics. Microplastics are those little, tiny, very microscopic, in some cases, pieces of plastics that shed. You know, we breathe it into our bodies. Um, it washes into the ocean. And the thing about um, plastic is that it retains toxic chemicals. It has that property. It retains not just toxic chemicals, but chemicals in general, some of which, of course, are, pl- are toxic. When it goes into the oceans, um, it you know, it's ingested by, you know, um, aquatic wildlife. And when we eat seafood, it goes into our bodies. 
Now, there have been some reports that say that, you know, this um, causes cancer. A lot of the toxic chemicals linked to plastics um, have been known to cause cancer, different various types of cancers, skin irritations when we wear it, um, uh, chemicals like PFAS and so on. Uh, there have been chemicals that they have been linked to liver disease and um, migraines, infertility issues, birth defects. So a lot of this is still being researched, and this is something you can do further research on. But the, the impact of plastics in our bodies and, and through the clothes we wear is incredibly harsh. Right? So not to mention that plastics come from petrochemicals, which are fossil fuels, and that also has you know, um, an impact on the environment as well. So I think it is important that we use natural textiles. Um, like I mentioned earlier, things like cotton, um, silk, hemp. Um, there are a lot of textiles that are being manufactured, you know, that, you know, things like tensile, new textiles, um, like mycelium, things that are, are, are new materials that are being made that have less environmental impact and also are not made from animal, um, animal products as well because um, the use of animals is another issue in the fashion industry. You know, there's the issue of fur, um, but also, you know, animals being abused in animal welfare is also a problem. So that's something else to consider. Resource extraction, whenever clothes are made, again, I talk about even when you use cotton, there's a lot of water that goes into um, making cotton. Um, so, and not just the water, but sometimes there's deforestation. You can see um, in the image there and with deforestation a lot of land is cleared to grow crops and this is not just in the fashion industry many other industries as well so whenever there's deforestation you know there's risk of desertification um there's you know there's an issue of you know forests being carbon sinks um there's also the issue of um, ecosystems, biodiversity loss, plant and animal species that are lost. You know, um, there's there's conflicting reports about how many animal species are lost every day and every year, but it's a lot. You know, some species, some reports will say thirty thousand a year, but it's still a lot either way. Either way. Um, so then there's the issue of toxic dyes and chemicals in the fashion industry. So. You can see the water there is pink. Now, this is a, a factory where clothes are made in a country in the global south. I'll give you an example. A few years ago, the Barbie movie came out. It was one of the biggest movies in a few years. Everybody was wearing pink. A lot of girls, a lot of women were wearing pink. And what happens when it, that pink color is trending? If you go to countries where clothes are made, the factories, you'll see that a lot of lakes and rivers will have pink dye in it. And some of these dyes are to have toxic chemicals in them. So it impacts the, um, the biodiversity and ecosystem in that community. It impacts the people that use the water in that community. Imagine this is where they get water for, you know, domestic needs, and it has toxic chemicals in it. And there have been studies and research done that show that this has caused uh, various types of cancers for people in those communities. I suggest you watch a documentary called The True Cost um, that will explain further. And then, and it's not just the people in those communities, it's us who wear the clothes, right? Um, there's also research that sometimes these toxic chemicals through our clothing can seep into our skin and cause um, health um, ailments, health implications, have health implications as well. And then there's waste waste to landfill. It's not just waste to landfills, waste to sometimes um, uh, excessive clothing ends up in oceans, um, in lakes and rivers in different countries, in soil. Um, so this is also a huge, huge, huge major issue. So we're actually consuming 400% more clothing than we did two decades ago. And we're wearing, keeping our clothes for much shorter periods of time, which is a thing that is leading to so much waste. So the fashion industry, I think, cons is, is responsible for, I think waste levels are about 93 billion tons per year. Um, and it goes to, some of it, it gets exported to the global south, countries in the global south, like secondhand clothing to the global south. Uh, some of it ends up in the 
Atacama Desert. So I think there's about 39,000 tons of clothing each year that's illegally dumped at the, At at the Atacama Desert. Um, and apparently through satellite images, it's been visible through, you know, from space, which is interesting. Um, so again, that take make waste linear system. Why are we buying clothes for short periods of time if it's just going to end up being dumped somewhere? That doesn't make sense. And destroying the in, in, destroying the environment, destroying the planet at the same time. And you know, these are issues that the fashion industry drastically and immediately needs to address. So you know, I talked about how clothes uh, end up being exported to you know, poorer countries in the global south. It's basically an estimated 4 million tons of used clothes are shipped across the world. And this trade of secondhand clothing is worth about $4.6 billion. Now, there have been reports from a government in Ghana who say that about 40% of clothes that arrive in Ghana are not usable. They're not resellable. They're just not usable. So they end up as waste. And you can see in that image, there's a documentary called Dead White Man's Clothes. It's on YouTube. I recommend watching that. That's where this image is from. And, you know, a lot of those clothes just end up polluting the streets, polluting, filling up the landfills in those countries, and also um, ending up in the ocean, right? And getting caught up in, like, engines of boats and and so on. And the thing is that those countries do not have the means to recycle these clothes. They do not. And, you know, in the documentary I'm referring to, they had a landfill that was meant to go for about five years, last that city about five years. It filled up in less than a year because of the secondhand clothing that's being imported to those countries. Now, people who export clothes to to these countries, of course, you know, it's a very lucrative trade. And they'll tell you, oh, it's for charity. And those people in those countries love it. And, you know, it's um, it creates a lot of jobs. It does create jobs, but then, you know, it's preventing local textile businesses from flourishing it's also um filling up their landfills you know and even if they use the clothes and enjoy it and embrace it for a while there's so much being shipped in on a consistent basis that they can't consume all those clothes in a world where manufacturing about 150 billion garments a year so even if we're you know those the countries in the global south even if they're embracing and receiving those clothes they can't, it, it's too much. So a lot of it, even if they use it for a time, it still ends up in landfill in relatively short periods of time because they have no means to recycle, right? We potentially in the global North have more opportunities to recycle clothing. Even if we can't recycle all types of clothing yet, we, we can certainly invest in um, infrastructure and research on how to recycle clothing and definitely um, create better systems for use, right? And what's what's really sad is that countries in the global north are not necessarily contributing to, you know, managing this waste um, when it comes to countries in the global south. So this overconsumption trend mill impacts people's mental health as well. And this is not a very popular conversation, but it makes people feel like they're not enough. It, it can lead, there have been studies done, it can lead to depression. Um, it affects people's self-esteem. Right. So it's really important for people to acquire things that they have a connection with, things that they know that they'll use and things that are useful for their life and their existence. So how of all these issues I talked about, and I appreciate your patience and listening, um, the solution that we need is to step off the fashion trend mill. How do we do that? First of all, drastically reduce the amount of clothes that we are manufacturing. And not just a little bit, drastically, 150 billion garments a year on a planet where we only have 8 billion people makes no sense. About uh, 84 to 87% of clothes that are manufactured every year ends up in landfill. Think about that. Secondly, we need to decentralize consumption. Consumption has become our life, <laughs> in particularly in, in the global Northwestern countries. You know, everything is about consuming and disposability and convenience. We need to stop making our lives about material things and about growth, individual, you know, uh, being human. You know, we need to redefine the concept of being human away from consumption and more about just humanity and um, development of humanity. And then the circular economy. Now, the circular economy principles, how you create a sustainable wardrobe is by reusing 
Um, Because they say that the most sustainable thing is what's already in your wardrobe. So reusing what you have, extending the life of what you have for as long as possible. If you extend a product, a garment for nine extra months, you save about 25% of resources, water and energy resources that it takes, that it took to make that uh, particular garment. So circular economy, repair, reuse, restyle, uh, rent or hire instead of buying you all the time. And then finally, stepping off the fashion treadmill, in fact, stepping off the treadmill in general, and instead prioritizing ethical values and humanity over material things, over consumption, because you can't have objects or material things being placed higher than human beings. You can't have finances and profit making being placed over human beings. So we need to get back to a place where we are prioritizing ethical values and human beings in order for our species to thrive. Okay, so that marks the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. My platform is EcoStyles. Um, you can find my Instagram is eco.styles. Um, if you, and I'm on LinkedIn as well. So if you have any questions or want to contact me about anything else, you can do it from this platform. Thank you so much for listening.